this is Metal Mike, and in this episode of the 80s Glam Metal Cast, we talk to Mr. Van Halen Rising, author Greg Renoff. He has a new book out called Ted Templeman, A Platinum Producer's Life in Music. This is a great read for all music buffs out there, with classic stories of Ted's work with bands like Van Halen, Aerosmith, and the Bullet Boys. We talk about it all. Check it out. Greg, welcome to the 80s Glam Metal Cast. How you doing, man? I'm great, Mike. Thanks for having me on. Hey, no problem. So you have a new book coming out, Ted Templeman, A Platinum Producer's Life in Music. How did this pairing come about with you two? So uh, I wrote Van Halen Rising over the course of three or four years. In the last year I was working on the book, I was able to find a way to get in contact with Ted Templeman. He doesn't have a website and he's sort of, you know, quasi retired he's not working in the industry anymore. And so I was able to, to through a, a conflict I'd made, get a way to reach him. And I reached out to him and told him I was doing this book on the beginnings of Van Halen. And he said, yeah, I'll talk to you. Call me. And I called and we talked for 30 or 40 minutes. And then when the book came out, um, I, you know, I quoted Ted in the book and the interview, uh, was based on obviously his experiences recording Van Halen's first record and his, signing of Van Halen in 1977, and he, he uh, when he contacted me in the uh, days after the book first came out, or the week after the book came out, he got the copy, he wanted to come out, and he really liked it, and uh, we talked a couple of times prior to, um, prior to uh, you know, the book kind of rolling out all the way, and he, I asked him if he would be willing to come out and do a book event with me, and he was willing to do that, he didn't want to pass it either with me, and we kind of hit it off and talked, and I had a real interest in his career beyond just Van Halen, and he uh, started emailing me, and I'd email him back, and that's sort of how it all sort of snowballed from there. I eventually asked him if he'd be interested in doing a book on his life, and uh, he was, you know, I think he was at first a little bit tentative because he, he's not a, a guy who's out there kind of, you know, pounding his chest and look what I did. It's not, you know, that's not the way a lot of producers are, are, uh, are kind of behind the scenes personalities. That's why they got into being producers. They don't want to be in the spotlight, and uh, I kind of explained to Ted that my vision for the book was to really pay tribute to the artists he worked with, from Doobie Brothers to LeVan Halen to Carly Simon to Bullet Boys to Honeywood Sweet. You know, he's on the huge, huge list. Uh, to try to you know, do my best to tell his life story and then highlight the great music that he made with these artists. Uh, he was he was game for doing it, and it, it uh, then started uh, the process, which took took longer than I expected. It, it ended up taking almost, uh, Van Halen Rising came out in 2015 and now we're in 2020, obviously. So it took, um, you know, it took a good, good portion of four years to really, by the time I really got the book rolling with him, um, to now to get it out. So, uh, it's been a lot of work and I'm, I'm proud of it, but, um, you know, it's been, uh, a really, a uh, dream come true for a guy who grew up a Van Halen fan and loved all the albums that Ted did from once he did with Aerosmith, and like we could go on and on. You know, I was David Lee Roth, uh, Sammy Hagar, VOA, to be able to sit with him and hear his stories and have him explain to me how he produced records and what he tried to do when working with uh, great talent. Like rehearsal and these types of things, it was, it was an awesome experience, and uh, it was great. So you had to be, obviously, like you said, you were excited to kind of get that inside point of view. Were there some things that he told you that just blew your mind? Yeah, I mean, I think, I, you know, I don't know if it blew my mind. I mean, there were definitely things that I was surprised to learn from working uh, working with him, talking about working with artists. But to me, you know, what I didn't really understand when I started working with him, what, what, what a producer really did in detail, I sort of had a general sense of that uh, in terms of, well, the producer might pick the songs and then coaches the artist in the studio. But to really understand it's like, uh, what Ted explained to me about the psychology of working with artists in the studio – how you sequence a record, um, how you keep a, a group from feeling uh, overwhelmed or bogged down in the studio, how you, his tricks for sort of keeping them fresh. So to think about those things, that was a whole side of the music business I didn't know anything about. So, you know, there were plenty of things he would tell me about, um, which we talk about in the, the book, write about in the book, about his, his interactions with bands as they're breaking up and these types of things. But for me... Even as interesting as that was just kind of learning how a producer thinks, if that makes sense, because that's something that I didn't really know much about, and I wanted to make sure that the book did justice to that um, aspect of 
of Ted's life and Ted's story, because obviously that's what, you know, that was what he made his uh, career on being a great producer. So what do you think, at least let's say applied to Van Halen, was he there more to make what they already had sound good or was he in on the creative part as well? You know, I think all, I think both of those things. I mean, I think the thing is that what Ted is really good at is, well, first of all, picking songs. I mean, Ted was obviously instrumental in picking songs for the record. Um, he had the final say on the songs that um, – Made uh, made the records in almost all instances, not totally, but almost in all, in I'd say ninety seven percent of the time, um, you know, he was able to sort of, you know, he would go for consensus. But if there was a song he really thought wasn't going to work, he he would be able to, you know, say we should save that for later, put that back in the can, and we'll come back around to that later. So, you know, there's that aspect. There's also the actual song craft part of it, where you know, Ted wasn't writing the songs, but Ted was certainly somebody who would listen to a demo or listen to a, a studio take and say, hey, if you sang this differently or you did this uh, guitar part differently or, hey, how about this drums enter um, a little bit later into the beginning of a song or something. Those are the types of things that, that obviously Ted would do in terms of arrangements and sort of, um, you know, standing off the rough edges off a song. So that would be stuff for, for sure. Um, you know, and then the, the whole aspect of producing is about capturing great performances, which is, you know, in some cases, you just let the person go at it and you're going to get a great performance, you know, maybe in the case of, someone like, um, you know, like an Eddie Van Halen or maybe a, uh, a Carly Simon, someone who's just a superlative type of talent, you're going to be able to kind of let them sing and or let them play and you're going to get good stuff. But other people, you know, are, are um, a little more challenged in the studio. It's a difficult, it's a difficult thing because every single note, every single breath, every single, everything you do is magnified. And so there might be more, um, you know, minute type of coaching or that Ted would try to do to try to get performances out of people who, who, um, you know, maybe worn as quote unquote, um, I don't want to say necessarily musically gifted, but more, more well suited or to the studio environment. So, you know, there was all those parts of things. And then there's things like sequencing a record, which I mentioned already, but that's something Ted, Ted did too, which is, as we all know, you know, you got to have an album that flows well. And that was what, what Ted would, would do after he mixed with Don Landy, they would sequence or Ted would sequence, which is thinking, Hey, what's going to be the first song? What's going to be the second song? Uh, what's going to be the last song on the record? And that, those were all the things that would go into the you know, job of the producer and there's more but that's sort of a you know sort of a big beginning of it for sure the big parts of it did he allude to some of what what his favorites were with van halen to work on and did any of that change over time because i know with all of us sometimes we're really in the zone with something when while it's out and then years later we're kind of like eh, you know what i mean or, or vice versa well you know I, I go into this in great detail in the book i mean i'll say his favorite song by Van Halen for sure is he talking about love. I mean, whenever we would talk about Van Halen, Ted would go back to that song and sort of as the, as the definitive Van Halen song, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you, know, you could say run with the devil and some other ones he would be like to unchained. I would be, you know, I'd be like all those songs, but um, he would always talk about how that, the lyric, the riff, uh, the vocal, the whole, the whole performance, especially the lyrics by Roth. He would really talk about how amazing those lyrics were and how that was a real, um, for him, a big landmark in his career, just to be, a, you know, to have uh, something like that be something he produced. He just said, thought it just came together so well. And he was a lot of credit to the engineer, Don Landy, who worked on that. Don was the guy, Ted thinks, who came up with the idea to put the sitar on the guitar solo, which makes that really sparkle, that whole guitar solo. And then the uh, the riff and just the whole thing from top to bottom. You know, another thing is that, uh, you know, Ted would talk about the song, the song Jump, where when he first heard it, he was not sure, and there's a lot of this talk about this, this whole, the making of 1984 in the book, and, you know, Ted didn't think that the jump idea, the musical idea that sort of a jump, the keyboard part in the sort of the beginning, the demo that Eddie had read, he didn't necessarily think the jump would fit with Van Halen's um, catalog. He didn't necessarily think it would be the song that they should do. There would be two, in other words, as a producer, from what I've learned from Ted, you want to think about, you know, if, a, if an artist really takes a left turn, is the public going to accept it? Is they going to like it, or is it too much? You know, you could you know think of other other examples. You know, um, an example might be like Linda Ronstadt went went new wave in 1980, which people mm -hmm. accepted. You know, maybe they didn't her her um, sales weren't as big as they'd been at her peak, but they people sort of went with it. You know, it's that type of thing where Ted thought, oh, this is a this is a completely keyboard driven song. I'm not sure Van Halen should be doing this song on a Van Halen record. But you know, over time, of course, he's come to see and he give his full credit in the book to Ed for having the vision to get the song, um, you know, basically to, to advocate for the song, it's a good song. And then 
you know, Ted said, yeah, let's work on it. Let's see where it goes. And then he gives a lot of credit to Dave for coming up with the great lyric as well, which, you know, the, both parts, the great, the great melody, the great, um, the great keyboard riff, the great guitar solo. And then that, that, um, the go ahead and jump chorus that Ted is like, you know, emphasize how catchy that is and how that was Dave's genius, something so simple that everyone could kind of relate to and kind of understand. So, you know, so Ted went from being kind of hesitant about jump to being now realizing that, you know, that was a, that was a huge moment in Van Halen's career. That was a revolutionary song. So he's like, yeah, you know, it's like, he, uh, he made the joke in the book. He told me it a couple of times. So we put it in there that it said, you know, I, I remember when I first heard jump, I thought it sort of sounded a little bit like, organ you might hear at a ballpark i didn't i didn't I'm like this isn't going to sound right on a van halen record he goes and now when you go to a stadium for any sporting you know you hear his jump every you know such an anthem every you know nba game and nfl game they they all play you know it's constantly played and so you know ted gives full tribute there to ed for, uh and the band itself for putting that song together but that would be a, an example of something where he was unsure you know but let those guys you know kind of said hey you know, let's all right let's go let's give it a try see where it goes we'll just We'll just work on it, and it just it developed into this great, great thing that he's come to really appreciate as a brilliant song. That's pretty crazy to think about. Is that let's just say he really pushed to say this isn't right, we shouldn't do this, and then they never did it. You know what I mean? And we never would have heard it. And and obviously that's one of Van Halen's biggest uh, commercial songs. You know, it's crazy. Yeah, I'm, yeah, and I think you know it's it's Ken and I both worked really hard to get the get that aspect of the story across. You know, and again, it was just for Ted. I think I'm saying, uh, I'm fair, I'm saying it in a very fair way to to, um, to what Ted said in the book is that, you know, he didn't think it necessarily fit with Van Halen. It didn't have anything to do with all that isn't cool or, wow, Ed, you came up with something really neat. He just was thinking about it in the context of Van Halen, right? Just thinking like, are kids going to turn on this record and hear this keyboard song and what's happened to my band? You know, what do those guys do? You know, they, what, they, I don't like this. This is not what I expected. I remember even as a, as a teenager... I just started really listening to Van Halen. I do remember older kids saying, you know, you know, kids who were, you know, started with Van Halen on Van Halen 2. This would have been like, I was 14 at the time, so this would have been like the 19-year-olds you'd talk to, and they'd be like, yeah, you know, Van Halen sucks, man. You know, they would kind of say compared to like, you know, what the hell happened to, you know, Cradle Rock was great, you know, or whatever they would say. They would just sort of talk about that. So I get that, um, you know, aspect of it. But, yeah, it's interesting to think about that. But, you know, it was... It was, uh, the other thing I think too is that, uh, you know, Ted was somebody who was willing to give it a, you know, give it a shot. He wasn't going to be the, the, to veto something that Ed felt so passionately about. And that was the thing. I mean, that's the truth. The truth is that Ed really thought it was a good idea. And he was like, this, I want to work on this and kind of, you know, push back against Dave and, um, Ted who were, you know, were just had, you know, reservations about it. it was to make, I think if you, we all think about how different Dump is. A chained, it's understandable why you might be like, yeah, I get it. Why that might be like, hmm, I don't know if it's going to work, but you know, you know, it all uh, it all worked out in the end. They worked on the song, and particularly felt and Don Landy too, and Alex felt so passionately about Jump. That was really the first song that they quote unquote finished. Um, in terms of recording the album, they worked on that song in the summertime, whereas some of the other stuff, like Hot for Teacher and some of the other material on the record, got finished later in the fall. So it was just saying there was just a real. You know, it was a song that Ed had stuck in his head and really wanted to get recorded, and they, they got it done. If we go forward a little bit to Eat Em and Smile, that was one of my early hard rock metal purchases, so it has a very special place in my heart. Um, that had to have been weird for Templeman with the split with the band and him kind of going with uh, with Roth. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I the, uh, the that period of time is really, really well detailed in the book. Ted was really impassioned when he would talk about that. I think primarily the thing I would want people to understand even when they open the book is that Ted hated the idea of Van Halen breaking up. Right. That he never, ever wanted Van Halen to break up. And he did everything he did in his power um, to try to stop it from happening, which didn't mean he could do, you know, he couldn't, you know, it's like trying to stop someone from getting divorced. You can't stop a couple from getting divorced or getting divorced. He did everything he could to try to to be a mediator and try to, you know, do he could to sort of convince people to, um, you know, I think particularly Dave, who was probably communicating more with Dave at that point to kind of, you know, hey, look, think about this. this you don't want to do this. And, um, but, um, yeah, the Eat Him and Smile thing is, it's, uh, it's a problem that Ted is enormously 
been almost a proud of now to, to step back even further. Ted had done the, the EP with Dave. So in the summer of 84, Ted and Dave went to New York City while they went on a tour break and did the four song EP Crazy from the Heat, which just sort of had the fun pop songs on it. It was meant to be a little passion project for Ross. And uh, so they had already done a solo solo thing, and then when they put together the Eat of a Smile Band, I said, Dave and Gabe, and, you know, put it together, Eat of a Smile Band, those guys all went to the studio, uh, Templeman and the four guys, and they did that. And uh, that was, a, I think, a, a real cool experience for Ted because he ended up working with such an, ama- an amazing band once again. Like Ted said, like, you know, there's no, there was no replacing the, the original Van Halen, but Ted really emphasized how incredible these guys were to work with, meaning she and Steve Vai and Greg Destinette, that they, the musicianship was just off the charts and it was sort of like a dream band. So it's that, you know, as disappointed and bitterly disappointed Ted was that Van Halen had broken up. And I, and I say that, and Ted talks about this in the book, you know, Ted, had, Ted was under no illusions that he probably was not going to produce the next Van Halen record after 1984, that there had been, there had been difficulties in making the record, which are discussed, I think, pretty well in the book. Um, you know, and there was just sort of, it was just everyone needed a break from each other, meaning Ted and Ed and Don, and they all just sort of needed to sort of step back because things had gotten had gotten difficult in finishing that record. Um, and so I don't think, the thing is that Ted wasn't wasn't walking around going, well, I'm going to produce the next Van Halen record. I think, in fact, he probably thought that I probably am not going to produce another Van Halen record, but it was just more for him. It was just, you know, he said it was like uh, the greatest rock and roll band I ever was around splitting up at their absolute peak, it just made me feel sick. And he just said it just made me feel so awful that they couldn't find a way to make it, you know, kind of work out the differences. But the Even Smile Band, yeah. Um, so part of it was done in uh, San Francisco at a fantasy studio, and then the rest was finished at the Power Station in New York, which was kind of the hot East Coast studio at the time. And, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a really a cool, a cool uh, record, I think, for, for Ted as well. He got to do a couple of things that, they might not be able to do in the context of a Van Halen record, you know, put strings and horns on, uh, that's life. So they had the Sinatra song and then the, uh, you know, just the kind of other twists and turns that are, that are in there along the way with the, with the whole, uh, Sheen and Vi thing. So it was, it was a cool, a, a cool, uh, experience for, for Ted, but as, as the book details, you know, Ted always held out hope that they would get back together. You know, that was what he wanted. He never thought like, oh, this should be great. This would be, this would be great. They'll be split up for 20 years. <laughs> you, know, never, you know, he was like, you know, it's like, it, it's like, you know, um, I mean, it's like, you know, look what happened with Aerosmith. I, I don't think we use, Ted used the, that example in the book, but, you know, Aerosmith, they split for like two or three years and then came back together. You know, Tyler laughed and, you know, Tyler, or I guess Perry laughed and then the other guys drifted apart and eventually Perry and Tyler and the band reconnected and they did uh dumb with mirrors. So I think that was kind of Ted's hope was that, you know, these guys will just blow off steam, do their own records, do a, you know, a Sammy record and then a, a Dave record and with, you know, Van Halen do, do a Sammy and Dave will do a solo record. And everyone will get back together. That of course never, never came to pass until much, much, much later. Now I, I like to do this stuff a lot. I do this stuff a lot on Twitter as well as I like to play like these uh, fantasy games where like this, this, what if this happened? What if that happened? So I, I also, you know, I often wonder if they would have stayed together with Roth. What do you think in your uh, estimation, what would have happened? Would they have had another huge album? Do you think it, where do you think they would have went if, if, uh, if they got, if the, you know, Sammy never went in and they did an uh, album with Roth. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, I think the deal was, for me, for in thinking about that, I mean, it, it's it's pretty clear that a lot of the material that Ed was writing was keyboard based at that sure. time. Uh, I'll give you an example. Like Dreams was an example of a song that Ed Van Halen showed, supposedly showed to the guys in Van Halen around the time of Diver Down or during 1984. The idea for Dreams, and they were all like, you know, they're you know they're kind of Ted and Dave presumably we're not hip on it, but that was kind of the stuff that Ed was, you know, he was doing more and more keyboard stuff. So it's hard for me to, to um, imagine Dave singing over that stuff, but that, you know, if they had done another record with Dave, I, I, I do think there would have been more stuff like I'll wait and jump than there would be. Um, then maybe we would, we would think. And I think that's part of the reason why Dave got frustrated was because, you know, he didn't, feel comfortable or didn't, you know, among the other issues that went on in, in the band at that time, um, I think the musical direction 
was part of the part of the issue for Dave that Dave didn't like singing those kind of keyboard ballad type of songs, if, if that makes sense. So yeah. if they were going to make another record with Dave, I mean, I think you would have had, and if it did, if he did bite the bullet and kind of accept that, Ed was the main guy who was coming up with the kind of the bones of every song, you know, the musical bones of every song. It would have been it would have been more keyboard aspect and i'm sure it would have been an absolutely monster record i think there's you know it's almost impossible to imagine after selling five minute million copies of van halen in 1984 that they wouldn't have sold even if it bombed you wouldn't have sold a one and a half million copies of uh, the follow-up so yeah i mean i think it was i think it was uh and you know the other thing too is the musical chemistry between those guys was so was so great they just even if they hated each other in gave and ed at different periods of time when they worked together it was magical I and mean, that was just that the, the the truth. I mean, there's just certain guys you put in the same room together and you get great music. And that was the, the way Dave and uh, Ed were. So, you know, and I guess a lot of ways it's kind of good that things happen this way because I know for me, I love Steve Vai. And I love when Steve Vai lines up with somebody like Roth or David Coverdale because it kind of brings Steve Vai in a little bit. You know what I mean? Because Steve Vai is awesome in his own right, but sometimes he goes kind of off the deep end with the stuff that he does. And I love when that little bit of his style, that weirdness that he has gets infused with like straight up hard rock. Cause it's just amazing. I think what he does is amazing. Yeah. I mean, he was really the right guy for that band. I think the, uh, the, uh, thing that kind of surfaced over the last few years, Ted mentions in the book, but it's been, it's been out. Um, the information has been out for a while. Is that Steve Stevens was actually the guy who was initially, I think Steve is the guy who actually, um, kind of made that, um, more publicly known is that Steve was initially approached by Dave huh. to do the Eat Him and Smile Band, and because Steve had a commitment to Billy Idol, he couldn't he couldn't make the timing work to join the David Lee Roth Band. I mean, I think that would have been another an interesting pairing, but I think that Vi really ended up being the right the right guy. He had this great sense of humor. He had obviously the virtuosity, and um, you know he had the songwriting ability where he could he could he could write. Some pretty good rock songs. I mean, he wrote wrote some stuff that was I thought was pretty pretty damn interesting uh, on the Eat Him and Smile record. You know, El Elf and Gun and some of the other the other things that were really pretty cool. Um, Yankee Rose. Oh yeah. So yeah, in, in the context of the of that band, I mean, that's the other thing too. It's so it's so unfortunate that that Dave didn't keep shouldn't say Dave, or just it, it didn't stick together. That the team that was Sheehan, Vi, Bissonette, Roth, Templeman didn't stick together for a uh, skyscraper. Right. It's really unfortunate. I, I didn't think, um, because that was a pretty, a pretty amazing, amazing band. And, uh, the whole, you know, that record, even a smile is, is, uh, is still to me, one of the, uh, the coolest things that, uh, Roth ever did. It's not, you know, just top of the band record, but certainly it's a solo record. I think it's, you know, I think most people would agree. It's the best thing you ever did as a solo artist. Yeah, and it was the right album for the right time, and with the video age, Dave fit perfectly in all the everything that was going on in the mid to late '80s. So, I mean, yeah, it was a home run for him at that point. At that point in his career, um, so Ted dabbled in a little bit into the hair model scene, and that's obviously that's my scene that I like. Um, what do you say about the Bullet Boys? What was going on with Bullet Boys? Yeah, you know, I was just on an interesting. I was just on a podcast the other night with Jimmy uh, Deanda, who's the drummer for the Bullet Boys, yep. as you know, and uh, he uh, <laughs> he's got some great stories about Ted. Some really funny stories, but I, I won't steal all Jimmy's stories. But I will tell you that, uh, yeah, Ted. So how that all came to pass is that Ted Templeman's little sister, meaning she was two or three years younger than him, ended up working for Warner Brothers in the seventies and the eighties. And she was an A and R person, which means that she helped figure out who um, who Warner Brothers should sign, and then you know, helped bring them to the attention of of the executives who would sign the bands. And so she ended up getting a line on a band called the Bullet Boys. And my understanding is that she said, "Well, to Jimmy, this is a good story." She said, "You know." Um, Jimmy and the guys in Bullet Boy, she said, well, I like your band. I'm with Warner Brothers. She's like, but, you know, it's not really my thing. She was she signed Jane's Addiction, and she signed Devo. So she was more of a, a, a um, more tuned to sort of the new wave, more maybe more new wave pop type of stuff. And so she said, well, I'm not, you know, it's not really my thing, what you guys do, but my brother um, might come down and, and check you out. And so her name was Roberta Peterson, because she, she married um, a gentleman by the last name of, of Peterson. Um 
<laughs> so so uh, the way Jimmy tells the story, they're like, oh, some guy named Peterson's going to come down and see us. Uh, okay, cool. <laughs> like, and and, they, and uh, anyway, Ked showed up at the rehearsal and uh, watched them and then, uh, yeah, offered to sign them. Uh, for what Ted explained in the book, that he said his sister was like, you know, this these guys could be something good for Warner Brothers and you should check. You know, basically she was very – she really thought the band had a lot of talent and was very like pushing Ted to do it. She, you know, um, she, I like, Ted said she was like militant about it. Like he was like, I don't know. You know, I know what I like, just, when she told the story, um, the way Ted told the story, she, she was, uh, she was like, no, you have to go. Like you have to go. And he's like, okay, okay, I'll go. And he, but he really did like the band. And, they, and then they signed them. Um, they did the record in LA and it was a, a great production team. They had, uh, so at this point, Ted was working with an engineer named Jeff Henderson, who's a friend of mine now and a friend of Jimmy's. And um, pretty much everything after 1985 that Ted did, uh, Jeff Henderson, who Ted met at the power station um, in New York City, uh, or through, excuse me, through the power station in New York City, um, great, great engineer. So Eat Him and Smile, Crazy from the Heat, Honeymoon Suite, uh, all those, everything that Ted did, uh, Jim, uh, Jeff worked with Ted. And then uh, Toby Wright, who was the assistant engineer. And then Toby would go on, of course, doing Alice in Chains and Metallica mm-hmm. and Justice yep. for All. He worked on so a lot of big, big records that Toby worked on as well. So they had this great, great sonic dream team, as I like to say. And that's one of the reasons that record sounds so great. But, uh, you know, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy really does a great job too. And Ted talks about it a little bit in the book, but Jimmy and tell you in more detail that Ted was really uh, instrumental in a lot of arrangements of the songs. For example, Ted had forgotten this and I actually reminded him we worked on the book and he said, Oh yeah, I guess that's true. Yeah, that is true that Ted's the one who came up for the drum beat for, uh, for the love of money. Oh, so okay. Ted is a, Ted was, Ted was a drummer. Is it, you know, Ted doesn't play drums anymore. When he was a kid, he played trumpet and drums and he actually played drums in his rock bands when he was a teenager in the 50s, 60s. And, uh, he, he came up with that, you know, that drum beat for, for the love of money. And so Jimmy was like, yeah, Ted was like, you know, like, uh, you know, the kind of said, I want to sit at your drums and show Jimmy what he wanted. And Jimmy didn't know he could play drums. And he was like, Oh, you can play drums. And he goes, yeah, yeah, I can play drums. <laughs> he was a, you know, basically played the beat for me. He's like, this is what I, you know, as they were working on the song. And so that's, uh, that's kind of stuff that Ted would do too, really get in with the arrangements of the, you know, kind of help those guys, all the acts he worked with craft their songs and make them better. You know, as a producer, you try to make the songs better. But, um, you know, he was, uh, he was extremely proud of the, uh, he talked about how proud he was of uh, the mix that Ted didn't actually have that very much to do with. It was actually the engineer, Jeff Henderson, who mixed, um, you know, uh, smooth up, up in you. Mm-hmm. That Ted said that um, that at that point in time, the the uh, mixing consoles had gone digital and they'd gotten really, really complicated. And Ted said it sort of had out exceeded his ability to to run the board, like you know, the old days when they had the you had the tape machines and the bo- the old boards that were from the seventies. Ted could do it would mix, and he said, but eventually it just kept getting more and more sophisticated. And I just couldn't keep up, so I could do some things, but I really couldn't sit at the board and mix anymore like I used to. So I would just basically sit with the engineer and, and talk to them and, and we would, we would talk and they would, they would make the changes. So Jeff said to, to Ted, leave me alone for a few hours. I'm just going to work on it. And Ted said, sure, I'll, you know, take a, whatever, take a break. Ted left for a few hours, came back and, and Ted said it was just un- unbelievable that how Jeff had mixed that thing and made it sound so monstrous and said it was just a, a great moment for him as a, you know, as a producer and then someone obviously was working with this engineer and you see the engineer kind of as, really can just like do this incredible work with the dead city, which is so thrilled that, you know, Jeff, it's like put this thing together. It's like, yeah, that's, that's perfect. You know, that's, I mean, I couldn't make that any better, you know, even if I told you to do this, do that. So talked a lot about that song and how powerful you know, the records and how big and how powerful it sounded. And just, um, you know, it was a cool, it was a cool, uh, I think, uh, instance for Ted to get really back into that hard rock stuff, which wasn't, um, something that he did all the time. You know, he did a lot of different types of artists, from pop to, to, to jazz, I mean, to jazz stuff. So he did a lot of diversity of stuff, but, you know, to kind of do that real hard rock, heavy metal stuff, I think that was a fun thing for Ted, too. It's kind of funny to think that, you know, Ted's involved, it's on Warner mm-hmm. Brothers, and there's the, kind of that little bit of Van Halen vibe with Bullet Boys. It's, it's, it's kind of funny, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's funny. Cause Ted never really, like, you know, like, talked to me overtly about that. I think that was more, I mean, I think that's where it's sort of break, baked into the cake. I mean, I think that's the obvious that, you know, I'm sure Ted understood that those guys were kind of a, you know, kind of in the mold of Van Halen. Yeah. But I mean, he never said, we're going to try to make this sound like Van Halen. I mean, in fact, I think if you talk to Jimmy, Ted would constantly try to emphasize, like, you guys got to get your own, like, you can't just like, you know, 
anyone who any artist he works with, and, they, and Jimmy said he said it to those guys, like you know, you should just you know, you guys got to forge your own way. Like they say, oh, we want to sound like this or whatever. Like not necessarily Dan Halen, but anything. He'd be like, you guys got to get your own sound. You know, you can't. No, no great artist. You know, is, who's going to laugh? Is like I want to copy Led Zeppelin, not those guys, but anyone. We'll, you know, like I want all our albums to sound just like Led Zeppelin. Well, after a while, it's just kind of become boring, right? Because you're like, well, I just listen to Led Zeppelin. I won't listen to this. These guys were copying Led Zeppelin. So Ted, um, as Jimmy points out, really sort of said, you're going to make, you know, you really want to try to uh, blaze your own trail to get your own own sound. And those guys, you know, for better or for worse, sure they had the Van Halen comparison, but I think you know they had their own their own thing going. That record did did great, went gold and. It was a big, a big MTV hit, as we both know. It was a big, big success. Oh, definitely. Um, is there a life lesson to learn, uh, you know, by his from uh, Ted's life? Yeah, I mean, I think the life lesson learned from the book is that, you know, you have to persevere through. Uh, I think everybody knows this. You know, you know, to really be successful, you have to persevere through tough times. The, the, uh, the part of the book that's really for me, kind of was kind of a, a, a revelation for me is that when Ted talked about when he, so when Ted was younger, Ted was in a band called Harper's Bazaar. So they were sort of a, a soft rock pop band. They weren't really rock, they were a soft pop band. It would have been called what's called Sunshine Pop. So bands like the Fifth Dimension, Mamas and the Papas, the Association, those like late, mid, late sixties, really soft rock stuff. Um, soft pop stuff was, was uh, Ted was in this band called Harper's Bazaar. And, by 1970, they had um, kind of run their course. They'd done four records of Warner Brothers, so Ted had did four albums um, as a Warner Brothers recording artist. And then he was looking to think about going into production. He wanted to be a producer. But, of course, you know, you don't just walk out of a group with a 25-year-old and they go, here's the keys, you know, the studio, go at it, you know, start recording bands. You have to work your way up. And so um, Ted had to start at the very bottom as a, a tape listener. So he went from being a, a pop star on TV to being the guy who was, you know, sitting in the room with no windows, with the radio, with the uh, the radio and the um, the tape player, and just listen to demo after demo after demo after demo. And so the band that found as we're doing that was the Doobie Brothers. He was uh, instrumental in getting them on Warner Brothers. And so, you know, Ted talked quite a bit about in 1970 right before this happened. He was thinking about quitting the music industry. That he was just like, you know what, I've got a kid, a college degree, and he said, maybe I'll become a school teacher or work in a bookstore. He was just, he was a history major and loved history. And he was like, you know what, this is, you know, I don't, you know, basically, you know, this isn't, it isn't, um, it, it, if, if no, basically if the music industry doesn't want me, why should I, you know, why should I like, you know, be banging my head against the wall? Because it's, you know, it's, uh, it wasn't as if that, uh, as I said, that he was being, uh, showered with job offers to do the type of, cause it was a career change. It wasn't, it was going from being, an artist to being somebody who was going to work in the, in the back end of the industry in some way. So he, uh, he almost quit the music industry. Thank God he didn't. Right. Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> so that was, you know, that was the life lesson. I think to sort of, you know, if you, if you, you know, really want something like we all know, you just got to, to work, work your way uh, through the difficult times and, you know, get your, get your foot in the door and go for it. Now, once you get a book done, are you on the horizon ready for the next one or how does it work? So, yeah, I mean, I think, Right now, with as we know, we're in the midst of coronavirus hell right. for everyone in the United States. I think it's like it's a whole it's a whole different <laughs> different um, mindset for me in terms of things. I mean, I think what I, I really was trying to focus on in the next couple of months is trying to roll out this book with Ted. We had right. plans to do we were going to do uh, and we will do them. I, I think eventually we do a book event for sure in Pasadena. We we're hoping to do something maybe at one of the universities in Los Angeles, kind of a master class with Ted, which we were working on, and then maybe a couple of other bookstores on the West Coast, Ted's out on the West Coast, and that's where he, you know, we kind of would emphasize this sort of these events, and we had some really cool stuff worked uh, up, did ready to go, and of course everything kind of fell to hell right. because of what happened. You know, again, I'm not, I'm not saying it's the worst thing in the world for me. Obviously, there's people that are much worse than I do, but you know, it's sort of a, it's, it's, uh, it's sort of difficult to. Uh, to kind of try to think about doing another book when you're trying to figure out like how to do this stuff right now, which will be planned, but they were so carefully thought out how to do this. They're going to kind of on hold for a while. But, you know, uh, that said, um, I really wanted to do this book in particular beyond it being Ted, but I thought it would be interesting to do it different. You know, I just didn't want to do another quote unquote rock bio where it was like, just tell the story of a band. I really wanted to try to, to do a, a true 
biography. Um, you know, that was one of the things I always wanted to do as a writer. And just the opportunity came with that. I mean, there's no better. I mean, it's like a dream. You know, for me, honestly, everyone who, who knows anything about me should know it's like a dream come true. And I'm like eternally grateful to Ted for this. It's the greatest thing uh, as a writer. It's been incredible. He's been amazing to work with. Um, but, you know, I will do probably another Van Halen book. I, uh, it just is hard for me to kind of get in the mind to think about that because everything's so uncertain now. You know, it's like yeah. I don't know, you know, how it's going to be because it could be like in June when like, oh, hey, green light, we can go and we'll do these book events. So it's kind of hard for me to sort of think like I should start the next project when I don't really know how the promotion for the next one, if that makes sense. It's just, it's, a, it's for me, it's kind of an unknown quantity at this point, how it's going to work in terms of, uh, you know, is it, it all going to get um, – push back for two months, three months, who knows? So it's, it's difficult, especially because LA is now, as you, as you, um, and I both know, and everyone listening knows is a real tough place for the disease right now. There's locking it down pretty hard. So it's kind of hard to know. Um, so, you know, that, that being said, there's, there's certainly another Van Halen book in my, in my blood and probably some other, other books as well. But, um, yeah, it was, I, I would sort of, would have, you know, kind of imagined it April, you can roll the book out, you stop it to May and then you can start to work on, thinking about another book, but it's sort of, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's sort of all unsettled going forward, trying to think about how to promote in terms of appearances and stuff like that, which I really do hope that happens because, um, if people want to check it out, they can go on YouTube and Google Ted Templeman, Van Hill Rising or whatever, it'll come up and see Ted, there's the, uh, Ted's appearance of Roman that's with me at the bookstore in Pasadena that was just, it was so worth him out of there to answer questions. I mean, it's like, it was like, you know, it was just, for me, it was, as an author, it was incredible. But I think for, as a fan sitting there and everyone else in the room was a fan, it was like so cool to hear Van Hill's producer say like, oh yeah, this is how I used to do this. And this is what we used to do. And just kind of giving you that inside uh, perspective on making those great records with Van Halen that nobody else could do. And so, you know, to have Ted sit there again, hopefully in the next few months at Broman's in Pasadena, which, by the way, he applied for a job there. Actually, that's one of that's the irony is that when he almost went to work at, which is really great. I mean, it's like it was like so so fitting because um, Ted was living in Pasadena at the time in 1970. Maybe do some other events as well. So I'm hoping it's going to happen. It's just you know, it's just you know, I'm just uh, but it's very uneasy about what's going to happen and not knowing how things are going to be be able to uh, finally un un, un uh, disentangle themselves with all this stuff with the which is so unfortunate. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to the promotion of something and being in crowds, obviously that that can't happen right now. But you know, it is a nice time if people have to lay low, get a book. A lot of people have a lot of time on their hands right now, so who knows? Maybe you know that'll work in your favor. That piece of it. I, I'm hoping so. I mean, I think that it's. I, I would say to people who are, are thinking about checking it out, I mean, it, it's a book that tells the story of a guy who grew up a jazz, you know, a jazz buff, like a jazz phenom, loved playing the trumpet. And sort of, you know, you, you learn through Ted's eyes and Ted's life how all the music he devoured as a kid from from Jerry Lee Lewis to, to Elvis to Stan Kenton to all these, uh, Charlie Parker to all these jazz guys to these early rock guys. It all kind of, it all sort of ended up playing out in the albums he made, if that made sense. In other words, his, his musical education as a kid and a teenager really, really shows up if you... Um, listen to the records once Ted explains you know I put I put uh, congas on this album particularly because I love this this album when I was a kid or I did strings on this because I love Motown it's sort of it, so to sort of have all of that in there so for people who are interested in sort of the musical development of the of the 20th century particularly in how how um, a producer thinks you know in terms of like how do you how do you craft a hit how do you draw upon your own musical love from Stax records to Motown records to, to all, you know, all sorts of jazz, as I said, folk, all these things and how those all sort of can be heard through the Doobie brothers, through Little Feet, through Carly Simon, through Van Halen. It's really, I think an eye opening thing for people. And hopefully they'll, they'll dig the story. Cause it, it, it gives you also a, a real, I think bird's eye view of what it was like to work for the biggest record company in the world, arguably one of the biggest record companies in the world through their, their absolute peak in the, through the seventies, all the way up through um, the nineties, when Ted left Warner Brothers. Greg, what's the release date of the book? The release date of the book, Ted Templeman, is, is out April twenty first. So it's available for pre order on Amazon now, Barnes and Noble, 
um, all you know, obviously any electronic bookstore you want, Walmart, you know, Walmart, you can get it from anywhere. Target, um, Audible, it's going to come out through Audible Audiobook. That'll be the same day, presumably April twenty first. It'll be out, and then um, it's going to come out in paperback or ebook. So you know, your Kindle or whatever your your Nook, whatever you read on, you can get the uh, PDF for the the Kindle or Nook book and read it. And of course, it'll come out in paper. And then, you know, again, um, online is really the way to go now. Of course, a lot of these bookstores are shutting down. Unfortunately, they close the doors. But right. um, yeah, it should be available once things clear up in any any bookstore in any town. There'll be copies there and uh, full of pictures. I'll tell you, there's a couple of real surprises from the photographs that I have not really revealed who's, who's donated some photographs to the book, mm-hmm. but it's really cool. Lots of um, unseen photographs, you know, again, sort of the stuff you might expect a Ted as a kid and stuff like that, but some stuff of uh, some of the bands Ted worked with and some really cool memorabilia from Ted's collection in there that we got in this book. So it, it's it's got some real cool visuals as well, and um, 400 plus pages, 440 pages, something like that. So, it, you know, it's... Uh, <laughs> people are like, hey, well, you know, how do you know when to stop it? You know, you sort of like when you were to reach that Moby Dick line, it was, you know, it was we were getting there. So it was, it's a great dense read. That I think will really hopefully capture people's attention. It's, it's not a, it's not a, uh, uh, um, uh, an overview. It really dives into a lot of the albums in very great depth, from the biggest Doobie Brothers hits to Nicolette Larson, Honeymoon Sweet. You know, you name it, all the stuff that Ted did throughout the course of his career, it's going to be it's going to be covered in detail. So hopefully, people will really uh, enjoy that as well. Awesome, man! I wish you lots of luck with it. It was a pleasure talking with you tonight, Mike. It was always always uh, a pleasure to sit and talk to the man who talks to the my heroes. <laughs> so enjoy your your podcast very much, and thank for being. Uh, really been uh listening and it's been fun to talk to you tonight so anytime happy to do it yeah and i'm sure we'll be communicating on twitter you got it all right brother take care that was an awesome conversation with greg well now you know what you have to do get online and buy the book we'll have some links in the description well let's talk about what's coming up on this channel you know it's been a few weeks and now it's time for an 80s glam metal beatdown Our next episode will be Alice Cooper versus Blackie Lawless. It's going to be an epic shock rock showdown. You got to check it out. Rock on!